Welcome explorers of the world's great mysteries. I'm Doug Kenyon, editor and publisher of Atlantis Rising Magazine. We call this program simply Conversations, and we feature the many great contributors to our publication, world-class researchers who dare to follow real evidence where it leads and let the chips fall where they may. In just a moment, we'll be talking to Boston University professor and geologist, Dr. Robert Schock, about his recent travel to the mysterious ancient Indonesian site of Gunung Padang. But first, for those of you unfamiliar with Atlantis Rising Magazine, let me introduce you to our publication. Focusing on ancient mysteries, unexplained anomalies, and future science, Atlantis Rising has for many years provided a serious forum for alternative ideas of prehistory, science, and culture. Ideas which, when uh, not entirely ignored by the mainstream press, are yet seldom uh, treated with the respect they deserve. Our magazine appears bi-monthly in printed form, and you can find it on stands in most major chain bookstores, such as Barnes & Noble, Hastings, Books A Million, etc. It is also available in many New Age outlets and independent stores. Uh, if your favorite magazine dealer doesn't carry it, ask why. For iPad users, our free app can be found at the Apple App Store. Postal subscriptions are also available worldwide. And you can get it in PDF form on an issue-by-issue -issue basis directly from our website at AtlantisRising.com. Among the many great articles in our March-April 2014 issue is a provocative story by Maverick scientist Susan Martinez. It's called Global Drying. Maybe it's not warming that should most alarm us. Then there is The Beasts of Beringia by William B. Stecker. Just how did Earth's many species get to where we find them today? Science, it seems, has some serious explaining to do. Uh, in The Man Who Could Not Be King, Stephen Sora chronicles the many secrets of Francis Bacon. And in Pythagoras and the Beanstalks, John Chambers explores what could have inspired a curious ancient prescription against eating beans, one that led to tragic results. And you'll also find a very exciting piece by our current guest, Dr. Robert Schock, a full-time faculty member at Boston University. He earned his PhD in geology and geophysics at Yale University. He's probably best known for his celebrated redating of the Great Sphinx of Egypt establishing based on water weathering that it's thousands of years older than is maintained by conventional Egyptology. He's also written though a book, uh, The Parapsychology Revolution, a widely read book on paranormal research. And his most recent book is Forgotten Civilization, the role of solar outbursts in our past and future. And that's from Inner Traditions 2012. His website is robertshock.com. Welcome to Atlantis Rising Conversations, Dr. Shock. Oh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, let's get right into it. In Journey to Gunung Padang in the March-April 2014 edition of Atlantis Rising, you look into the case for a lost ancient pre-Diluvian civilization in Indonesia. 20,000 years ago, you write, during the depths of the last ice age, when sea levels were as much as 130 meters lower than present, the current Java Sea was not a sea at all, but fertile land. Here lay plains and forests bounded by the mountains of Java to the south and the mountains of Borneo to the north. And through this land, a major river system ran from west to east. With uh, the rise of sea levels at the end of the last ice age, it was overtaken by ocean water. So would you talk to us about recent discoveries in this area and what all that might mean to the orthodox version of the history of civilization? Well, what we have in West Java, and it has been discovered, at least discovered by scientists and by academics very recently, although the uh, local people seem to have known about it for decades, actually centuries or millennia, is a site, it's in West Java, as I mentioned, and this would have been the southern border of what geologists know, know as Sunderland, this drowned, basically subcontinent 
that, as you mentioned, stretches from Java in the south to Borneo uh, and actually all the way up into Indochina. It includes uh, Malaysia, it included uh, Sumatra, and all of this region was above sea level at the end of the last ice age when sea levels were much, much lower and it was flooded by the rising waters at the end of the last ice age about 9700, 10,000 BC, so around that area about 12,000 years ago. And what we have now recently discovered in West Java is this site which stands in the mountains of West Java. It's known as Gunan Padang and it seems for all the world to be essentially the best way to describe it is a crude step pyramid. It sort of looks like a crude step pyramid and what is very interesting is that it apparently dates back to the end of the last ice age and when I say crude step pyramid that's not really giving it justice. That's sort of the superficial view because right now it's in somewhat ruinous condition as many ancient sites are going back 10, 12,000, even 20,000 years. Uh, I've had a chance now to go there to look at it firsthand. That's what I describe in the Atlantis Rising article and we want to talk about now. And I'm convinced that number one, it is an artificial structure. It's an ancient artificial structure and that point is very important to make because there are a lot of sites around the world where, to be honest, they're either hoaxes in my opinion or they're ambiguous. This is the real thing. And secondly, based on the geology and analysis that has been done there by the Indonesian geological team that is exploring and studying it, I'm convinced that it does go back to the end of the last ice age. Now we're looking at a one of your pictures right now that you took. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, the first one that uh, we were uh, talking about before uh, we uh, got going here. Uh, it appears to be a kind of a hill covered with a bunch of, uh, of um, rather sharply uh, shaped rocks is the best way I can describe it at this point. What's exactly, but let me explain what we're looking at because if you're not a geologist, it looks essentially like a pile of rubble, as you say, sort of a bunch of sharply shaped rocks, that type of thing but it's actually very diagnostic to myself as a geologist that this is not how these rocks would normally occur. What we have in Java are lots and lots of volcanoes. It's one of the most um, you know, volcanic terrains known in modern times. I think they say that uh, Indonesia itself has more vol more volcanoes than any other modern country. So you have lots of volcanic activity. What we're looking at are volcanic rocks, specifically andesite, what is known as andesite. And these rocks often form, and this was the case at Gunan Padang, they form what are known as columnar joints. Now these columnar joints, it's a matter of how the lava flows and then crystal cools and crystallizes. People may be familiar with the concept of columnar joints because there are some very famous examples like the Devil's Causeway or, uh, I'm sorry, the Giant's Causeway it's called, or the Devil's Tower. And the thing about these joints is they look very regular. They tend to be hexagonal or crudely hexagonal, but they stand vertically. When they form, they form vertically they're all tightly packed together in a vertical structure, so sort of like a honeycomb structure, but the columns themselves stand vertically. So, and that, no, yes? go ahead, go ahead. No, and that is what we have as a basis at Gunan Padang. But what occurred at Gunan Padang, and I confirmed this myself by looking at it on site, is that ancient peoples took these columns they basically separate out the natural columns that were vertically uh, standing originally, all tightly packed together. They must have spent a, an incredible amount of time and energy pulling these columns apart along the natural joints, along the natural fractures. 
and then they use them as the building material. So this is very, um, it's intelligent to work with nature like that. Uh, essentially half the quarrying has been done for you by nature, if you would, and it gives you a lot of sort of long uh, blocks of r rock, which weigh hundreds of pounds apiece. So these are not easy to uh, move around. It takes a lot of work to move them around, but you could think of it as essentially logs, stone logs that they now had to work with, and then they use these to erect the constructions that we see at Gunan Padang. They use them sort of like um, building a log cabin, if you would. Uh, they use them horizontally. They arrange them to build structures. And the way they're arranged, uh, especially the horizontal aspects interlocking together, this does not occur in nature. So they were building it um, you know, using the natural rock, but rearranging these rocks. And this is not the only place where we see this type of construction. Uh, the famous example that some people may be familiar with is in Micronesia, Nan Madal, where the same type of structures crudely, you know, when I say crudely, uh, analogously were built using columnar joints in a basaltic rock and then taking those chunks of rock that naturally occur vertically, pulling them apart, rearranging them horizontally to build structures. Well, let's uh, look at the, the rest of your pictures here and uh, see what you can tell us about them. Uh, we're moving on to the next image here uh, in, your, in your series, number three, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we're looking down from a, uh, there appears to be a uh, mound to the right and a tree in the middle of a space to the left there. That's right. And what you're looking at here are foundations, if you would, of substructures on Gunan Padang. Uh, Gunan Padang has several le levels, several terraces. That's how they've been named by the modern geologists studying it. And here you're looking down uh, on one terrace from an upper terrace. So you're looking down. You can see that there is sort of the foundation structure, if you would. Uh, the tree is, modern tree is sitting in the middle of it, but you can see the outline of a foundation of some kind of structure on the left side. On the right side, you can see the somewhat ruinous remains of some type of a structure. And if you look at those stone blocks, you can see how they're long and regular, even here and they're laid out horizontally. This is not how they occur naturally. And again, from this view, it looks a bit ruinous, but that's not unexpected in my experience for a structure that's uh, well over 10 or 12,000 years old. And here's the next image. Uh, we're, again, um, looks like uh, we, the, the stones form a, a big uh, squ uh, square or exactly. and, uh, in there. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So here we're looking on sort of the right or center. Again, we're looking down from an upper terrace. You can see how there's been laid out. You can see how some of the stones have been laid horizontally. Some have been erected in isolation vertically, or maybe they've been re-erected. You see some of the ground. You see some in the uh, background along those lines. But I think uh, it's pretty evident looking at a photograph like, photograph like this, that those are regular artificial structures. I'll call them foundational structures. Hmm. And then the next image uh, to the left there, we have what appears to be a stone wall. Exactly. Now, this is actually very, very diagnostic. Here you see a stone wall on the left. We'll call it a stone wall. But this is buttressing one of the higher level terraces. and what look like stones, just sort of stones making us, those are actually not just simply short little stones or small stones building a standard stone wall, as many people might be familiar with. Those are essentially, think of stone logs. Those are the ends of the logs that go in toward the left as you're looking at it. So those are stacked up essentially logs of stone, if you would. 
that make a very firm, very strong structure. And again, I would stress that I looked at these carefully. They are not laid out as they would be if this had been formed by nature. They were separated out. Those would have been standing vertically initially. They were pulled apart and then used to build this structure. And the next image here, we're looking at a, a more open area. Yes, this is now on the top of the site. So if you think of a step pyramid that does not come to a sharp point but comes to a plateau, we're looking at the top of the site here. And I want to mention that this top, the um, uh, top of the site is about 885 or so meters above sea level currently. So close to 3,000, about 2,900 or so, if I remember correctly, above sea level feet. So close to 3,000 feet above sea level. But when the Ice Age was in full swing and sea levels were hundreds of feet lower, this would have been the top of a mountain overlooking Sunderland to the north. And it would have been an elevation of well over 3,000 feet. And it, today it gives a magnificent view, but it would have been an incredible view back then. You think the top was cleared artificially? Uh... I believe the top was cleared artificially. And again, what you see here, I believe, are the remnants of foundational types of structures, Those that regularity that you see. And the whole, the entire structure is aligned a little bit off of north. It's not aligned perfectly north, but apparently for a reason, because it faces another mountain. It aligns to another mountain known as Gunungade, which I was told has been a very sacred site going back as far as anyone can remember in the historical literature or the prehistoric literature. It seems to be a tradition that uh, the site or the mountain that you look to toward the north was considered a sacred site. So I think there's something important here in the alignments and the view from Gunan Padang. And the next image uh, looks like, uh, I think you call this a detail of uh, many, many stones. Yes, yes. And here, what you can see, I think, very clearly is how the stones have been arranged horizontally. Uh, here, I think, in this view, you can see how the stones are arranged horizontally, again, like logs in a log cabin. And uh, this, I want to stress, is not how they occur naturally. Again, this is on the surface, so it's had thousands of years of, you know, being exposed to the elements, collapse, that type of thing for a structure that is so old. Yet this portion of the wall, I believe, is still in quite excellent condition, and you can see the details of structures on it. Okay. And then we see you beside a similar wall here. <laughs> exactly. Now, in this view, if you look at it closely, I have my hand on one stone that is sort of going in horizontally. You can see sort of below that, uh, more toward the ground, some of the horizontal stones. And then you can see somehow some stones that are angled, right angles to those. So again, the way they built this, sort of, I use the analogy once again, like logs, building a log cabin, putting the stones horizontally in different angles, locking them together to make a very very uh, strong structure. One thing that the Indonesian geologists said to me was that they felt that this structure survived in part because it was so well built. It's so sophisticated in the way the stonework is interlocked because this is a very, very active area tectonically. Lots of earthquakes in this area. In fact, a lot of the geologists in Java and Indonesia more generally, and specifically the ones that I was speaking with on site, their primary uh, purpose, should we say, their primary job when it comes to you know not studying archaeological sites is to deal with earthquake hazards, earthquake predictions, uh, how do you build structures that will withstand earthquakes. 
So they were very, very impressed by this ancient site and that it's been able to withstand uh, earthquake activity and volcanic activity for so very long. The next image shows you with, it looks like a number of the people you were working with there in that, uh, in your this, expedition. This is correct. Uh, you'll see me sitting in the middle. This is a picture that my wife, Catherine Ulysses, took. In fact, she took all of these pictures, I believe. Uh, and I am talking there with, doc, di, with Dr. Danny Hillman Natawijaja. He goes by normally just Danny Hillman or Dr. Danny Hillman uh, Natawijaja, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, is his um, surname, Indonesian surname. He is a native Indonesian, although he has been trained overseas from Indonesia and New Zealand. He got his PhD at the California Institute of Technology. Technology, his PhD in specializing in um, geology and tectonics and earthquake prediction, that type of thing. So a remarkable uh, man. He and I got along very well. I really enjoyed visiting with him and discussing it. And he is the person who has actually been leading the geological team at the moment studying Gunung Padang. And in front of us, you can't really see it, but in front of us, spread out our number of maps and seismic profiles and geophysical data, which he and I were discussing, and he was really pleased to show me, and it was incredibly interesting. At the very moment when we're talking here, we're talking about some of the geophysical data, and you can see him demonstrating with his hands some of the structures, geophysical structures. Something that is really important and interesting to me is that it's not just the surface features that we have at Gunan Padang, but he has been able to probe down about 15, 20 or more meters in depth. And they, he and his team have done this a number of different ways. They've used electrical resistivity, which people may or may not be familiar with. It's something I've certainly worked with as a geologist. He's used ground penetrating radar, which many people are familiar with. It's a popular way to study below surface uh, structures nowadays. He's uh, used seismic, as I have used around the Great Sphinx in Egypt, to model what is underneath Gunan Padang. And he's actually had the opportunity with his group to drill. So he's drilled boreholes down into the structure, received permission to do that. So he has a lot of subsurface data. And he was able to demonstrate to me with this data that these structures, these artificial structures that we see on the surface, go down a depth of 10 to 15 meters or even a bit more, depending on where you are on the hill, on the mountain. So this is not just a surficial feature. It's not just on the surface, it goes down to this incredible depth, which again indicates how old the structure is and how sophisticated it is. And in the boreholes that he took, he brought up samples of the rock and the sediment. And in some of those boreholes, he found artificial cements, he believes, which are very sophisticated for such an ancient structure. And he also found material that has carbon in it, which could be used for radiocarbon dating. And it's this radiocarbon dating that has really allowed him to get a handle on exactly how old the structure is. So uh, you're talking about, in, uh, what's he saying, uh, uh, 12,000 years? Uh... He there's, there's several different layers that he has identified. This is typical when you're a geologist and you're doing this type of work. You tend to find different distinct layers, and that's typical of archaeological sites. He has identified five major layers going down to about 15 plus meters. And the oldest one, so that would be the lowest one on the bottom, is 20 some thousand years old, actually probably more like 22, 23, maybe a bit older, 1,000 years. So about 20,000 BC, let's think in those terms. And then working up the layer, there's layer four, 
then there's layer what he calls layer three and layer three is actually the most interesting to me because I think it has very good data he's got uh, several dates for this radiocarbon and they come in at the very end of the last ice age about 10,000 11,000 BC in that range and this is to me incredibly interesting because this layer from what we can see seismically what we can see from the we'll call it remote sensing the geophysics looks like it's very sophisticated as we see on the surface with those types of structures it dates back to the end of the last ice age the same time that I've been talking about for a long time with my work on the Sphinx for instance in suggesting that civilization goes back to a much earlier period yeah, I, wanna, I, want, I want to ask you about all of that, and I'll get into that in a minute, but before we leave this, I wanted to, uh, I did, took the, I took the liberty of here of throwing in a picture from uh, Nan Madol, just, oh, right. just to uh, show you the kind of, uh, uh, of rocks we're talking about, which appear at Nan Madol, and hold on a second. I don't, anyway. Uh, but anyway, here are pictures from Nan Madol, which uh, are of the same type. Do you see any relationship between uh, Nan Madol and uh, Ganong Padang? Right now, I'm not sure what to say about that. In terms of, yes, there's certainly a relationship in that we seem to have similar types of building materials, similar types of structures. But that is also a function that that's what they had available at both sites. So, mm -hmm. for instance, this ties in with another issue I wanted to mention. Danny Hillman, the geologist, in the photo we were just looking at, and I were discussing where did the materials come from for Ganun Padang. And he and I both were hypothesizing that they didn't come from anywhere exotic. They came from right there that you had the materials right in place, they disassembled them from their natural situation and then rebuilt them into this artificial structure, which would be incredibly efficient. And I think that the same thing was happening at uh, Nan Madal, that you were using the local materials that you have in place. This is actually what you find at many ancient sites. Um, you have exceptions, of course, other places where they moved certain types of rocks incredible distances but in other cases they would also use local bedrock so that's one aspect well it certainly uh, implies a, a level of organization in society which is anomalous in terms of the standard hunter-gatherer oh absolutely i think in both <coughs> nan madal that was another good point both nan madal and Gunan Padang, you cannot say these were primitive people, that these were hunter-gatherers with little, if any, social organization. To move these blocks around, multi-ton blocks, actually, um, you know, ton, just under a ton to multi-ton blocks, takes incredible, you know, energy. You've got to amass human power to do that. You have to organize. You have to have a plan ahead of time. Hopefully, you know, you're not doing this just randomly. So I said, I think it says a lot about the level of sophistication that you see at both sites. My understanding, and I've not explored this for myself yet, I hope to be able to, but my understanding is that at Nan Nadal, you have more of these structures underwater and the dating, in my opinion, is uh, you know questionable for Nan Madal. I just don't know what the dating is. I will not be surprised if when all is said and done, it also goes back to a very early period, maybe the same period, so and may, may tie in in that sense, too. Well, we're talking about pre-Diluvian civilization, right? I mean, basically, oh, that's, absolutely. that's absolutely. the kind of thing which is, uh, it's, not, it's supposed to be crazy talk. To it's supposed talk to be about crazy this. talk, but we're finding evidence now around the world that's good, that's genuine, that is stands up to scientific scrutiny that we have these pre-Diluvian civilizations, genuine civilizations. Well, let's uh, take this to uh, what you got into with your book, uh, the uh, forgotten civilizations, and your your whole concept of 
uh, solar outbursts as the uh, mechanism which uh, brought the, uh, or part of the mechanism which might have brought the ice age to a close, and how this, uh, uh, what this means to us. Yeah, absolutely, and that ties back if, um, to something I was starting to talk about with Nan, uh, Nan not Nan Madal, Gunan Padong, and I want to tie this together. The ice age, the end of the last ice age, is best stated now by geologists, and this has been published just in the last couple of years, to about 9700 BC, almost exactly 9700 BC. And there's a massive warming at 9700 BC. This is recorded in um, ice core data, sediment data, um, various isotopic data, and it has long been a real mystery as to what caused the ultimate end of the last ice age. And now that we have this new data, it demonstrates that it happened even more quickly than anyone suspected, certainly more quickly than I learned in graduate school. So this has been a real perplexing problem. Furthermore, about 1,200 years earlier, before the end of the last ice age, there was a, cut, there was a sudden cold snap and that's known as the Younger Dryas. And I mention both because a lot of people get them confused. There was a Younger Dryas, that's a time period geologically, that lasts from about 10,900 BC to about 9,700 BC, about 1,200 years. It gets very cold at 10,900 BC, and then suddenly gets really warm at 9,700 BC. And to make a long story short, there is a lot of evidence for, for a comet or something like that impacting Earth or maybe exploding in the upper atmosphere. The best evidence is over North America, about 10,900 BC, but that's not the end of the last ice age. The end of the last ice age is actually 1,200 years later with a sudden warming and what I have come to conclude, and I discuss this, as you said, in my book, Forgotten Civilization, is that all the evidence points to a major, major solar outburst, what are known as coronal mass ejections, plasma discharges, that's electrically charged particles, major solar flares, what are known as uh, proton events, uh, you know, highly charged uh, particles, fast-moving protons, et cetera, impacting the Earth's atmosphere, impacting the magnetosphere, and driving down to the surface and causing all kinds of havoc, not just changing the climate and warming up the Earth, but massive melting of glaciers, massive um, evaporation of oceanic water, lake water. This would have set off earthquakes. It would have set off volcanic activity. It probably raised radiation levels, almost certainly raised radiation levels at the surface of the Earth. And one way to escape this was to go into caves, to go underground. And I'm not the only one that's talked about this. And that, I think, is something that organisms had to do, including humans, if they were to survive this in many, many areas. It just now, happens. Back, I started to say it just happens to line up with Plato's date for the sinking of Atlantis, too. Oh, absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up because Plato, if you take Plato literally for his dating, as I believe we should, and you turn it into modern chronology, as we talk about, because, because, because of course Plato did not talk about BC and AD, but when you change it into BC AD dates, Plato is talking about 9600 or so BC, which I think is a very good <laughs> estimate. In fact, a lot of geologists to this day, they'll talk 95 to 9700 BC. I prefer the 9700 BC. But Plato is essentially spot on, accurate, as to when the last ice age ended and when I say that he did not say the end of the last ice age, he was talking about the destruction of Atlantis and advanced civilization at that time. And I believe that he was talking about the same thing that we now call the end of the last ice age. 
and the destruction of the civilizations, advanced civilizations that had arisen um, before the Ice Age ended. I think we have that represented now with my work at Giza with the Sphinx in Egypt. We have that in southeastern Turkey with Gebekli Tepe. We have, I believe now, evidence for this advanced civilization or civilizations in Gunung Padang in West Java. And, you know, the, the story is coming together. Tell us about Gobekli Tepe. Well, Gobekli Tepe is incredibly sophisticated. It uh, looks like a bunch of, uh, well, people think to give people a visual image if they haven't seen it. And I've got nice photographs, color photographs, and forgotten civilization, of course. We're looking at And have picture. written about it in Atlantis, Rydie, Atlantis Rising, as you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, we're looking but, at a picture of you right now in Gobekli Tepe here. Oh, are you? Okay. Yeah, this is the one uh, that appeared uh, with the article, but... Uh, you're here with your your bag over your shoulder. Uh, oh yeah, yes. So you, so you can see in the background one of the stone enclosures, or maybe a couple of the stone enclosures in that picture. And at Gebekli Tepe, we have these. I hate to use the analogy, but it works for people. We have these Stonehenge-like circles of megalithic stones. Mm -hmm. But they're not Stonehenge-like in the sense that Stonehenge are these big, crude, rough-hewn stones. At Gebekli Tepe, they're beautifully worked. They're beautifully carved. They have reliefs on them. They have animals carved on them. There have been sculptures, beautiful sculptures found at Gebekli Tepe carved in the round in stone. So it's incredibly sophisticated. I've uh, identified astronomical alignments, as other people now have also at Gebekli Tepe. And the real point of Gebekli Tepe for us right now is it dates back to nine to 10,000 or long, older BC. So it dates back to the end of the last ice age, actually bridges the gap or crosses the end of the last ice age and it's not supposed to be there according to conventional standard paradigm thinking. People were supposed to be hunter-gatherers back in 10,000 BC, yet they were building Gobekli Tepe. They were carving, I believe, the Proto-Sphinx. They were building Gunan Padang. When I first started talking about this back in the early 1990s, the Egyptologists at the time, a guy named Mark Lehner in particular, said it was absolutely impossible. People didn't build such things back then. They were all hunter-gatherers. They were primitives. Another Egyptologist told me that they didn't have the social skills or organization that long ago to do anything more than essentially, I'm paraphrasing, grub in the dirt and barely eke out a living. And we just know that's not true at the moment. And the story that we're piecing together is that there were cycles of civilization. I spoke with Danny Hillman about this in uh, Java when I visited Gunan Padang. He's now become convinced of this also independently based on the data in Indonesia that there were cycles of civilization. So just, there like, was, uh, just like the priests of uh, uh, Tol Solon in Egypt there. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, he was told that the Greeks, the great Greek civilization that we all, you know, the Renaissance envied and, and we still learn about in school was not the beginning of civilization, was not an initial peak, if you would, of civilization, that it was a remembrance. It was a new cycle. Cool. But in fact, there have been these great civilizations not even thousands of years ago, are thousands of years earlier, but tens of thousands of years earlier. And the last, uh, not the last one, but one of them, I believe, certainly peaked toward the end of the last ice age, but was destroyed and thrown a huge setback at the end of the last ice age with the natural disasters of the time. And civilization went into this dark age, if you would, this, this uh, demise for thousands of years before re-emerging. What do you think, uh, what level of advancement do you think might possibly have been achieved in this uh, forgotten era? 
Oh, that that is very hard to know because I was starting to say the way to survive, just to survive, really would have been to go underground into caves, that type of thing. And we find that uh, now throughout the world associated with some of these early sites. Uh, there's actually caves associ apparently associated with Gebekli Tepe. The archaeologists in charge have just barely mentioned this because to them it's not that important. I wanted to uh, say before I forget, at Gunan Padang, something that Danny Hillman and his team have have uh, discovered with the remote viewing uh, materials. So when I say remote view, I'm talking seismic uh, geophysical techniques. I'm not talking parapsychological uh, at the moment. But with the, uh, with the um, seismic techniques, they have identified a chamber within Gunan Padang, within the hill, that he is convinced and I was convinced that this is very likely looking at the data he showed me that it may have been natural initially so it may have been a natural cave but then it was modified artificially plus he was able to show me on the seismic diagrams where the entrance seems to be and it goes up to layer three which is the layer that corresponds to the end of the last ice age, the dating on it. So here we have one more example where I think they retreated those that were able to survive and then restart society. Under the Sphinx, of course, we have what Casey called the Hall of Records and Thomas De Becky, the geophysicist and myself, uh, discovered physically in the early 1990s. Now, now you asked what kind of level of sophistication did they have back then? I just don't know, but I'm hoping that if we can get into some of these um, storehouses, what are potential storehouses, maybe we could learn. Hall of Records uh, type situations. Yeah, Hall of Records type things. Because uh, right now, the most of the evidence that we have is stone. And stone would have survived. That's why we have the stone work. If, you look, at, if you look at Gebekli Tepe, I am more and more convinced every time I go there, every time I restudy my photographs as I look at more and more, there are things that look like H's, the letter H on some of the um, stonework on Ekebekli Tepe, H that looks like it's on its side, things that look like a letter C or a backward C. There's other apparent symbols. I don't put it past the possibility that they had writing, that they had other sophisticated um, things we might not even be able to dream of right now because we're a different culture, we're a different society. If everything was destroyed from our culture except, you know, a few monument remains of a few monumental buildings, some big chunks of concrete and a, a big, you know, Hollywood-sized sign somewhere with a couple of letters <laughs> on it, 10,000, 12,000 years later, what would people speculate about us? Would they realize the level of sophistication we have or not? I don't know. Well, I'm just wondering, uh, this reminds me, of course, of John Anthony West's uh, comments about the Church of Progress and yes. a striped toothpaste and hydrogen bombs. I exactly. Was wondering, I was wondering, do you, do you agree with... Uh, uh, with his views about uh, the dangers of, uh, of modern progress? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, uh, l l yeah. let me back up a little bit. Uh, uh, you bring up John Anthony West, and I want to give him um, all the honor and respect he's due because he's really the person that got me into all of this, and he is a very close friend and colleague. You know, he's a, uh, he's a grand old man as far as I'm concerned. I mean that within the best way of uh, what we're all working on now, you know, looking back at sophisticated ancient civilization, he started much of the current round of this. And I, I agree with him that I'm not sure that our, quote, progress is always so much progress. Yes, we have technological progress. We have, as he says, striped toothpaste and hydrogen bombs. But do we have the wisdom to go with it? Do we have uh, this philosophical uh, uh, sophistication to actually know what we're doing with it? And I wonder in many cases if we're not more primitive philosophically and in terms of wisdom than people back at the height of the last 
civilization, and I'm talking end of the last ice age in this case or further back. So maybe we're different in the sense that we might have a different technology, what could even be argued as a more sophisticated technology, although I'm not sure about that, I just don't know. But have we lost a lot? I suspect we have in other areas. We you know. may be dooming ourselves. We were also, I wanted to mention back to the solar outbursts and solar flares, that type of thing. We have a very sophisticated but very fragile technology that could all be wiped out um, by one major solar outburst. And again, I'm not a scaremonger or whatever. I'm not trying to spread fear. I'm just trying to be realistic. Well, you know, uh, we were talking about uh, John Anthony West, and of course he was guided by the work very much of Swato de Lubitsch. Absolutely. And, and I wonder uh, what you think of, uh, I mean, Swato de Lubitsch, of course, uh, made a lot of major uh, statements about the advances of ancient Egyptian civilization in terms of their knowledge of sacred geometry and the human body, among other things. And uh, now there is a science and a technology which uh, we might learn something from today. Um, what do you think of that? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the, absolutely. The next person to mention is Schwaller, and I've read Schwaller's works, um, and John Anthony West and I have discussed Schwaller on site in Egypt many times, and I love the term. Is It is in... Um, uh, English translation that Schwaller uses, sacred science, combining two things, the sacred or the religious, as we might say in our culture, and the science, the technology. Because in our culture, many times people see those as adversarial, that religion is on one side, science is on the other side. And I think that the ancient Egyptians and other ancient peoples before them were able to combine these in uh, a very astute way. They they had a real understanding, I believe, of what the cosmos, our place in the universe, lost um, today. So uh, I think we have a lot to learn from them. And I also want to point out, and we talked about this already a little bit in the last hour, the ancient Egyptians themselves, they did not see themselves as the origin or the beginning of this knowledge. They felt that there was a civilization they had inherited it from, that they were just um, like essentially using knowledge that had come to them from an earlier civilization. Again, this concept of cycles of civilization, and they were not the first, they were not the earliest, and that the civilization before them knew even more, had deeper insights. Well, I wanted to talk to you a little bit before I... Um, uh well, I've got you here that uh, about your ideas about parapsychology and uh, that kind of research and some of the things that you've uh, investigated uh, in terms of the, uh, it's a big subject, I know, but I wanted to know what you felt about uh, the work of people like uh, uh, Rupert Sheldrake, for example, and his talk about um, uh, morphic residents and other things and, and other people like Robert Lanza, who's saying that uh, the material world is an effect of spiritual causes, not the other way around. How some of that gels with your, uh, your research into the paranormal? I, I think it gels very well. I, I have great uh, respect for the names you just mentioned. I really have come at this in some ways due to my work on ancient cultures, on ancient peoples. Sometimes people ask me, well, how did you get into the parapsychology issues? How do you, why, were, why are you thinking about things like telepathy and clairvoyance and all that, I mean, especially being trained as a scientist, having a PhD in geology and geophysics? And there's two aspects to it I want to mention right now. One is the ancients themselves talked about parapsychological, or we might call it paranormal phenomena on a regular basis. And many of their structures, they ostensibly felt, were built in part to enhance what we would call paranormal or consciousness experiences. So a obvious question to me is, well, if they were spending all this time and energy on that, was it all nonsense? Were they just a bunch of superstitious idiots as 
frankly, a lot of conventional scientists and archaeologists and historians would say, were they just a bunch of primitives, or did they maybe know something that we don't know? And I have become absolutely convinced, based on, I don't know, decades now, of studying parapsychological types of phenomena, that yes, there's absolutely something real there. Yes, there's lots of fraud and charlatans that goes with any field, but there is something there, and it's incredibly important as if we're going to understand our universe, understand ourselves, we need to take these, what some people see as irrational aspects into account, the paranormal, the parapsychological, the very concept of consciousness. What is consciousness? Um, what is thought? I mean, there's no really good answer right now from a strict scientific point of view. Some of the great physicists, once they um, sort of break the shackles of standard paradigm thinking, they come out and um, come to the conclusion that there is more than just the material world, just the energy world that um, of classical physics. And when I say classical physics, even talking about relativity and quantum physics, that there's something beyond that, um, underlying that, and maybe it's consciousness, maybe thought, is um, the most fundal fundamental aspect of all. Well, how are you... Uh, and that, that's essentially what the ancients were saying all along. So maybe they knew something we don't know, well, or some of us don't know. How, how do your peers at, uh, at uh, say, at Boston University, I'm thinking of your students and also other faculty members, how are they dealing with the, with the things that you get into these days? Uh, it's becoming easier over the years in some ways, perhaps, because I think maybe some of science is catching up with some of this. Actually, the last chapter of Forgotten Civilization, my latest book, deals with some of these issues and some of the breakthroughs now in uh, science, even conventional science that's demonstrating that there's a lot more that we um, don't know or has not been acknowledged. So part of that, and you know, just the whole concept of quantum theory or quantum mechanics and some of the weird things that are going on with that, I think has opened up people's minds. But on the other hand, there's still a lot of, um, should we say, you know, people don't want to acknowledge things, they get embarrassed if anyone brings up certain topics. I, I, I'm not stupid in the sense of, you know, in academic, academia, at certain academic situations, I don't talk about this stuff. I mean, what's the point? People are just going to smirk and look the other way or, you know, it, it's, it's a sad, it's very sad. But you're, so not ex uh, you're not exactly a shrinking violet in other areas and you've gotten pretty well known for yeah, a lot yeah. of what you're saying. Uh, yeah, I, I would say so, but I, I, in everyday life, when I say everyday life, when I go into the office and I sit in faculty meetings and that type of thing, I don't, um, uh, you know, what's the point of trying to, uh, <laughs> to, 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 to bring this stuff up? People know who I am and they know what I'm doing and, and it's almost like a test and understanding, well, we won't talk about that now. Uh, can you... <laughs> if that makes some sense. Well, I know I understand. And, and then I want to say this, though, too. People who publicly would never defend me, would never support me, that type of thing, and, you know, take the status quo position because it's good for their job, it's good for promotions, et cetera, et cetera. I have had more than a few cases, people like that who will even smirk, that type of thing. If any of this comes up publicly, say in a meeting or in a seminar, if they see me in the back hallway, should we say, <laughs> late at night <laughs> with, with no one around, and they'll start out by saying, don't ever say I said this because I'll absolutely deny it. And then they'll start telling me about their paranormal experiences or, or, or their, their own beliefs and crazy theories and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, would they ever say this publicly? Would they ever even suggest that maybe there's something to things publicly? No, because they just, you know, it's easier for most people to just blend in, to be part of the conventional status quo. And ultimately, I hope that there'll be enough people that, you know, actually, I want to say I'm hoping that 
the paradigm shift it, shift is happening now. I think it is happening now. But with any revolution, with any shift, you still have a point in time where the vast majority of people, no matter what they're believing inside perhaps, they um, they don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to inconvenience themselves. They don't want to look stupid, quote unquote. Um, you know, peer pressure is very strong in academia and everywhere else. Well, you know, one thing that uh, amazes me about you is how much you travel. Uh, I know that you're <laughs> every time I'm in touch with you, you're taking off somewhere or coming back somewhere. And I know you were in Turkey, for example, I think during the, the unrest of a few months ago. I oh, think yeah. that was the same time that there was uh, the marathon bombing was going on in Boston. And yeah. I'm thinking that you go from one to the other. And I'm just wondering how you're holding together through all of this. Oh, I don't know sometimes. <laughs> no, I think I think what drives me is just, I really want to answer these questions. I really want to make sense out of things for myself. And uh, one way to do that is to really explore these topics thoroughly. There is nothing like being on site to see some of these um, you know, ancient structures. You can't get it just by looking on the internet or reading books. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Well, how is how is all the, the unrest, like in the Middle East, uh, affecting uh, your uh, aspirations in that area? It doesn't phase me too much, but there are practical considerations. You just can't get certain things done, and I'm not foolish enough to go someplace and get myself killed. Uh, <laughs> hopefully I'm not foolish enough. You wrote an that. article for us a few issues back called The Bloody History of Archaeology. Yeah, uh, yes. I mean, people really do, you know, when, when you impinge on people's world views, on their religious beliefs, that type of thing, um, it can get uh, dangerous in terms of physical danger. I don't want to go into it too much now, but <laughs> I've been threatened. I've had people say some pretty nasty things to me very bluntly, which can be taken as threats against my life. And in hindsight, I'm not sure. I don't think they were kidding, that type of thing. Uh, but I think the more relevant, relevant aspect for me is I don't want to, find myself in a situation where I'm, should we say, in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. So, you know, one has to be careful. But I think also this ties in with uh, where do you draw the line, so to speak, in your own life? Um, where are you careful? Where are you not so careful? This is not that much different than what we were talking about a few minutes ago. Okay, so I sit in a faculty meeting. What's the point of bringing up certain subjects? I mean, they're not really relevant. I'm not going to get, you know, it, it, Agreement. that's not the battle to fight. Um, but on the other hand, if I'm in a lecture where I'm talking about this, whether it's a university setting or a New Age symposium, if I could use those terms, I'm going to say what I believe and where the evidence leads me, where the data leads me. I think I have to be true to myself and true to the data. And to me, that's much more satisfying than just sticking with the conventional status quo if the status quo is not supported by the latest data we have. So. Well, uh, I hope and I wish you very well, uh, uh, Robert, and all of your uh, continuing uh, efforts here in this area. And uh, I want to thank you very much for talking to us here. And, uh, it's been a pleasure. Well, we've been and talking. I think you're doing great things with Atlantis Rising, really, uh, you know, making people aware of uh, what is happening and, you know, alternative views, if I could put it that way. And, and that uh, the status quo and conventional science and conventional paradigms are not necessarily what they are touted to be. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Shock. Robert, as we call you, we've been talking with celebrated scientist, author, and researcher, Dr. Robert Schock, professor of geology at Boston University. For more on his many ideas and theories about the past and the future of our planet, we recommend his books and, of course, his articles in Atlantis Rising. For more on this, check our website at AtlantisRising.com. This is Doug Kenyon for Atlantis Rising Conversations.